Black Star Network is this. Hold no punches. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Black Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Rollins. Stay Black. I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black Owned Media and something like CNN. Mm. You can't be Black Owned Media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Friday, October 27, 2023, coming up on Roller Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. Ooh, Kentucky's Republican Attorney General, Daniel Cameron, who's running for governor, he is, ooh, mad, upset, angry, hot under the collar with Black Voters Matter because of a radio ad they dropped uh, calling him Uncle Daniel Cameron. We'll talk with Cliff Albright, co-founder of Black Voters Matter, about the condemnation of Uncle Darren, Daniel Cameron. Also, we'll examine by mobilizing the black vote post-Obama has been difficult. The director of the Black Voter Project will explain what he's finding in his latest research. The attack on voter rights continues. Dr. Wes Bellamy, the chair of advocacy at 100 Black Men of America, will discuss why we must keep fighting for our voices to be heard and what must be done to specifically mobilize black men. A Pennsylvania judge reinstates the murder charges against a former cop 
who shot a motorist in Philadelphia within seconds of arriving on the scene. That and more will break down. It is time to bring the funk on Roland Martin Unfiltered. It's going to be live with the Black Star Network. Let's go. He's Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. Yeah. Daniel Cameron, the Attorney General of Kentucky, who is the Republican gubernatorial candidate, is not happy at all with Black Voters Matter because of this radio ad. What's up, Kentucky? It's election time, and all skin folks ain't kin folks. Over the past few years, we've taken to the streets to demand racial justice, to demand health care, and the right to make decisions about our bodies. And now Uncle Daniel Cameron is threatening to take us backwards. The same man who refused to seek justice for Breonna Taylor now wants to run our whole state. We can't let that happen. We won't let that happen. On November 7th, vote Andy Brashear for governor. Paid for by Black Voters Matter Action Pack, which is responsible for the content of the... Lord, well, Daniel dropped this tweet here. Um, go ahead and pull it up. For years, I've been called every racist name in the book for supporting President Trump and conservative values. Andy Bashir always looks the other way and remains silent even today. <laughs> he upset, y'all. Uh, joining me now uh, from Atlanta is Cliff Albright, the co-founder of Black Voters Matter. They dropped that ad. First of all, they're calling y'all Soros back. That's always the phrase they use uh, to try to tie anyone, anyone to George Soros, anything that he does. Uh, so, Cliff, why did y'all drop this ad and use that language against uh, or upset uh, Daniel? Yeah, thanks for having me on, Roland. I mean, we, we dropped it very simply, right? Because it's it's the truth. Um, you know, everything that we mentioned in the ad, he hasn't attacked the accuracy of, of the ad at all. Did you or did you not let go and refuse to charge the, the people, the police officers that killed Breonna Taylor? So you don't want to talk about the substance of the ad. He want to talk about the Uncle Daniel Cameron. And, 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 and technically, we didn't call him Uncle Tom, right? That to do so actually would probably be more of an insult to the actual Uncle Tom, but that's a whole another story. But you know, the uncle could have been anything. It could have been Uncle Ruckus. It could have been uh, uh, Uncle, like you know, we call Maxine, Congresswoman Maxine, uh, Auntie. Maybe we use it affectionately. The fact of the matter is, soon as he heard it, he heard Uncle Tom, right? You know what we say, Roland? Hit dog, will holler. He's hollering mighty loud. Um, he saw himself in, in an Uncle Tom attack. But at the end of the day, what it's about is basically just reminding our folks that this is the same man who's been against our community, not even just in terms of the Brianna case, uh, the Brianna Taylor case, right, say her name, but everything else. Look at what he stands for. Look at his attacks against health care and, and, and trying to peel back the Medicaid expansion that took place in the state, that is a direct attack against the health of black communities. Look at his attack, unsolicited attack, against affirmative action, where after the Supreme Court had their affirmative action case, which dealt only with education, here comes Daniel signing a letter uh, with a bunch of other attorney generals, basically warning companies that they need to end their affirmative action hiring policies. Ain't nobody asking to send a letter. That wasn't even what the Supreme Court decided. He just went and took it upon himself to go out and, and pursue such a letter, which, again, directs our communities, attacks our jobs, attacks our, our wages, attacks our families. So it's not even just his stance on the Breonna Taylor case and police accountability. It's issue after issue after issue where he has shown himself to be just as much of a threat to the black community as, as, as the staunchest white supremacists. You don't have to be white to pursue and reinforce white supremacist policies, as we said in the ad, all skin folk ain't kin folk. 
Uh, and you laid out all of those particular issues. Uh, and when we talk about Breonna Taylor, first of all, the federal trial begins on Monday uh, for one of the officers who was involved in that. Uh, it was Daniel Cameron who, oh, I found nothing. I found nothing. But it's amazing how the feds found stuff. Uh, and have already gotten guilty pleas, but he found nothing and did nothing. Right. And he hides around, you know, you'll, in every interview, anytime he's asked about it, he'll say, well, all I can do is, is uphold the law and, and follow the law. And, you know, my hands were tied. You know, I just, there was nothing I can do. And we know that that's not true. We know that that is gaslighting to the highest degree. We know that there are all types of violations that could have been filed, just as the Department of Justice um, is, is, is currently doing so against those who killed uh, Brianna, who murdered Brianna. He could have done that. Other uh, attorney generals uh, were able to do the same. Uh, uh, Keith Ellison in, in Minnesota was, was able to do the same. I mean, so there have been others at the state level, at the county level, and at all levels have found it somehow within the law to, um, to enforce when police officers kill a black person. It, to say that there was nothing he could do is basically he's repeating Judge Taney's line from the Dred Scott case, where he's basically saying um, that a black man or woman uh, and sitting in our own apartment, sleeping in our own apartment, has no rights which a white man or a white police officer is bound to respect. Again, when we have an attorney general and a candidate for governor that takes that kind of a position, that is a threat to our entire community. And we say it again, all skin folk ain't kin folk. Um, when we talk, and, and again, I think what you have here is you have uh, Cameron not wanting to tick off police unions, uh, wanting to kiss up to them, uh, and so and, and that's what you're dealing with here. Exactly. I mean, he's 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 cast his lot. Look, he decided a long time ago which 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 team he was going to be on, and whether that's the side of the of the police unions or whether that's the side of Mitch McConnell. I mean, he takes some some amount of pride, and Mitch McConnell takes some amount of pride in in calling him like one of his proteges, right? And so, you know, he's. He's picked his side, um, and his side is very much the side of anti-blackness. His side is very much the side that's against our, our safety, that's against our health, that's against our economic well-being, that's against our education, that's against our maternal health. Um, on all these issues, he's picked the wrong side. And, I mean, look, uh, and this is a perfect example of if we use the phrase, uh, all skin folk ain't kin folk. The reality is uh, the white Democratic governor of, of uh, Kentucky uh, has made it clear uh, he restored the voting rights of formerly incarcerated. Uh, he has been clear where he stands on Medicaid expansion, which impacts African Americans. He's made it clear where he stands on voting rights. Here's a perfect example of a white Democrat who, frankly, is, a, is aligned more with black voters than black Daniel Cameron Republican. Exactly. Exactly. And that's why we always say, you know, Rolla, we always say um, that, you know, we're all about us, right? The, the back of our shirts say it's about us. Um, we focus on our issues. It's not about glorifying any particular candidate, and nor is it about demonizing uh, another candidate, even the candidates that, that we don't like or, or may disagree with, right? But it's about what are the issues that different candidates stand for. And at the end of the day, um, Andy Bashir is, is, is head and shoulders um, just in a different league when it comes to, you know, his position on issues that are, are of concern to our community, whether it's restoration of voting rights or, or voting rights even more um, writ large, or, or whether it's police accountability or whether it's uh, uh, health care or reproductive justice on, on all these issues, um, issues that impact our community, there is a fundamental difference. And so uh, any day, you know, it's funny because people think that, you know, people like to say, accuse us of, uh, you know, Roland, they say, oh, you only voted for Obama for 90 something percent because he's black and y'all are just all about y'all are just all about race. And that's racist. And then when we come out of ad criticizing a black candidate, <laughs> they say, oh, that's racist. Well, which one is it? Are we, are we always guided by race and we'll vote for anybody black no matter what? Or is it that, uh, in fact, that we are actually guided by the stances on our issues? And if Andy Bashir or any other white Democrat is going to be better on the issues than a black Republican on our issues, then we're always going to fall on the side of our issues at the end of the day. Uh, and that's what it boils down to. And for and black folks in Kentucky, uh, it's abundantly clear that Daniel Cameron uh, has not been on the right side of the issues that black folks care about. 
it's abundantly clear. And that's why we're doing what we're doing, because, you know, you, you might have some folks that, that that don't know that it's that clear. Right. Maybe maybe they don't know about all these issues. Maybe they know about the Breonna Taylor, but maybe they get confused when he gaslights us and he says, well, I, I did everything that I can do. Right. Or, or, or maybe they don't know about his position on health care or maybe they don't know about his 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 anti LGBT um, um, positions or any of the other positions that are, he's got a thing on the attorney general's website, Roland. Not his campaign website, the attorney general's website that says that one of his top priorities, you go to the website right now, pull it up. One of his top priorities is to stop wokeness. You are the attorney general of a state uh, talking about that your priority is to stop wokeness. You sound like DeSantis. And we don't need another DeSantis in the state of Kentucky any more than we need him in Florida or, or any place else. And here's the other deal. Uh, he is standing four square with Donald Trump, and we damn sure are not. And so uh, if he wants Trump back in office. That absolutely is not uh, beneficial to black people. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't even talk about that. Thanks, Roland, for, for bringing that back up. I didn't even mention that. Yeah, he stands squarely with Trump. He says Trump is good for the country. Even when asked specifically, you can listen to interviews when he's been asked specifically and repeatedly, because evidently the, the, the person doing the interview just couldn't really believe what they were hearing, where they, they asked him about specific things that he has said about the black community, about specific policies, about um, specific things that he said about uh, predominantly black or African descent countries, right? And in and, and, every case, all the camera would fall back on is, you know, I believe he's best for us. I believe his values are best for us. Like, why he would use Donald Trump and values in the same sentence, I don't even understand that. And so, at the end of the day, no, we don't need somebody who even now, even now, knowing all that we know about not just his, his horrible policies as, as a twice impeached president, but knowing all we know about the insurrection, about the coup that he, he tried to do, um, even now, knowing all this, he still stands squarely with him. He is a threat not just to our community. He is a threat to this entire country. We cannot have him. It's bad enough that he's in the attorney general position. We definitely can't have him in the governor's mansion, not in any state. Uh, uh, not only that, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here uh, and, and I'm going on his website and... You know, and, and these are sort of the broad. Go to my go to my iPad, please. Um, he, he's got all oh, better schools. Come on, guys. Come on, let's go. Better schools, strong economy, uh, and and then then and then look look at them. Work requirements for welfare. First of all, we already have those things. Uh, get income tax to zero. Well, then how are you going to pay for stuff in the state? Uh, then he's got uh, safe streets, and then that's it. Like that. That's it. That that that's all. So right. safe streets, strong economy, better schools. That that that's y'all. That's all that's on the website. Ain't nothing else. That's right. That's kind of limiting. Right. It's it's very limiting, and it's it's the traditional. It sounds like Mitch McConnell, right? It sounds like a little Mitch McConnell clone. You want zero income taxes, which is which is basically what Mitch did, uh, uh, and the Republicans did with that big tax break that they gave to you know the, the wealthiest in the country. When they say that they want a tax break, they're not talking about regular folk. They're not talking about our folks that are, that are struggling every day. They're talking about their friends, the, 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 the big wealthy people, right? The, the big elite, uh, and giving them a tax cut, which then does what? It puts all the rest of us in even more economic stress, right? And so you look at that website and those, three, those things that he has on there are the usual thing. We wanna, um, we wanna give our friends a tax cut, we gotta we gotta scare you to death about crime. So we could talk about safe streets, right? Which just means more police, more profiling, all right, more black folks getting shot. Um, and then he's got the schools thing on it, which we know is really just code for the, the privatization that they're trying to do to our school systems all across the country. That's the usual stuff. That's that's just Mitch McConnell light. That's Donald Trump light. And we don't need that. Again, it is rooted in anti-blackness. It is a threat to our community. It's a threat to the entire state of Kentucky. It's a threat to the entire country if we allow him to elevate. And just real talk, it would set our movement back to allow the, 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 the person who, but next to the police officers who, who killed Breonna Taylor, who killed Brother George Floyd, next to them, the face of this anti-blackness of that period is Daniel Cameron, the leading face that that was most staunchly saying, "No, we're not gonna, we're not gonna uh, prosecute um, these police officers." 
to allow this person, after we were in the streets for months, talking about how our lives matter, talking about police accountability, to allow this person um, to, to, to rise to the level of governor would really be a, a, a setback. So it would be dangerous. It's dangerous for our community. It's dangerous for our families. But it's dangerous for this entire country and, and our movement. So I just want to show folks again. Uh, go, to my, go to my computer, please. So this is the plan of Daniel Cameron, his vision for Kentucky. It's three things, better schools, strong economy, safe streets. This is the issues and priority of Andy Bashir. Early learning and child care, fiscal responsibility and transparency, jobs, economic development, expanding high speed internet, infrastructure, boosting Kentucky's signature industries, expanding access and reliability of clean drinking water, expanding health care access and affordability, prioritizing public education, public safety, fighting inflation, investing in higher education and workforce development, rebuilding Kentucky after disaster, supporting our military, revitalizing Appalachian, Kentucky, and leadership of the Appalachian Regional Commission, supporting seniors and the most vulnerable, protecting. Kentucky families, dealing with the opioid addiction, uh, promoting Kentucky values and the golden rule, protecting your rights. Uh, sounds to me, uh, and uh, sounds to me like, um, hmm, there's a lot more broader, broader uh, plan here. In fact, uh, right here, uh, he has in here vetoed a bill creating additional obstacles to voting. Daniel Cameron, he sided with that particular bill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you know, people people sometimes, you know, some of the crit critics of, of Black Voters Matter. And let me be clear today. I'm speaking on behalf of our of our PAC side, Black Voters Matter Action Pack. That's who actually did the ad, as you hear in the disclaimer. Um, and sometimes we get accused of, oh, y'all just for any Democrat or whatever. And, and no, we criticize Democrats. We criticize President Biden when he wasn't doing enough on voting rights. We criticize other moderate Democrats. We've been asked to get involved in races in some states for some candidates where we take a look at the candidate. We just like, that's, we can't do that. That's not, it's not consistent with our issues, with our values. We're not going to use our scarce resources. In this situation, we have absolutely no problem saying that there is a stark difference between the policies pursued by, by uh, Governor Bashir and the, the policies and, and the track record, the dangerous track record of, of, um, of, of, of Uncle Daniel. And so, and, and, and I want to add this too, it's interesting, Roland, this, as you played, this was the radio version. They haven't even seen the video version of the ad. When he sees that, he's going to he's gonna really flip out, right? And so why is it that he's even paying so much attention to this ad? What he knows is if he really thought that he was going to get all the support that, that Mitch McConnell gets, that other white Republicans get, he wouldn't be, he wouldn't be paying attention to, 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 to our little radio ad, right? But he's scared. He's scared because he's counting on digging into a certain amount of black support. And when he hears an ad that, that criticizes his stance on, 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 on our issues, the issues that our community cares about, that worries him. And so this ought to be a message to anybody watching this race that he is vulnerable, but it's going to take deeper work, more resources to reach black folks so that we can get this message to them that, again, all skin folk ain't, ain't kin folk, that we can't trust Uncle Daniel, Daniel and that we've got to come out and, and vote. Uh, indeed, indeed. Cliff Albright, we appreciate it. Thanks a lot. I can't wait to see the video. <laughs> it's coming, Roland. It's coming. <laughs> All right. Got to go to break. We come back. We'll talk to our panel about this uh, and cover up more news of the day. Uh, folks, uh, you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the like button, y'all. We want to get at least 2,000 likes every day. It ain't that hard. Y'all love to comment. We'll just hit the like button. Also, support us in what we do. Your checks, money orders, uh, with your contributions uh, to Cash App, PayPal, Venmo, Zelle is critically important for what we do. Uh, senior check and money orders to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash App, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale, rolling at rollinsmartin.com, rolling at rollinmartinunfiltered.com. And be sure, of course, to download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. You can watch our 24-hour streaming channel, folks, uh, on various platforms, including Plex TV, Amazon, Amazon News, Amazon Freebie, and Amazon Prime Video. We'll be right back. 
I'm Dee Barnes, and next on The Frequency, we talk to award-winning screenwriter and director Chanel Dupree about her film, You Think You've Grown, The Adultification of Young Black Girls. This is a conversation that all women can relate to. This woman was like, oh my God, you know, I, I went through this when I was a kid. She wore something, it was a maxi dress, but the way it fit on her body, this uh, female teacher thought that she looked too grown and spun her around in front of a male teacher and said, "What do you, do you think she looks grown, right? Oh my God. So that's next time on The Frequency on the Black Star Network. Don't you think it's time to get wealthy? I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show on the Black Star Network focuses on the things your financial advisor or bank isn't telling you. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037- 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Hello, I'm Marissa Mitchell, a news anchor at Fox 5 DC. Hey, what's up? It's Sammy Roman, and you are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. <laughs> All right, folks, Michael Imhotep is the host of African History Network show out of Detroit. Uh, also, Matt Manning, civil rights attorney out of Corpus Christi, Texas. Dr. Amakongo Dabinga, senior professorial lecturer, School of International Service, American University out of D.C. I'll start with you, Amakongo. Boy, Daniel Cameron, he is not happy at all. <laughs> and it is great to see. And the way Cliff talked about it could have meant any uncle, uncle ruckus, or just any that 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 had me going. But you know, he should be concerned because you know when you meet people like Tamika Palmer, the mother of, of, of Brianna, and and you see the activism, we we are showing, and Cliff is showing, and all of the other groups on the ground are showing that we have not forgotten Kentucky. And people always have this mentality that when it comes to our type of activism and things that we do, that we you know, oh, just give it some time, it's just going to blow over. We have shown that we're going hard in Kentucky, and as you've always said, Roland, on this show, you got to support organizations on the ground. I didn't hear any mention in your entire conversation about anything that the DNC was doing or partnerships with the DNC, taking it right to the people is where we need to be devoting our resources. And, and Cameron should be concerned because he is still identifying with somebody who is a criminal, who is charged, and how many different trials he wants to ride with him and go down with him. Well, what is Trump really going to do for him at this point? Now, I can understand if you want to enjoy the support of a Mitch McConnell down there in Kentucky, but to continually tie yourself to a man who's multiply indicted and facing all of these different charges, it's a losing battle. But also, what we are doing on the ground is going to be more important than anything they can do, because I really feel like Kentucky, especially with, with Bashir running for re-election, he's not some random candidate, and looking at that website and just showing a difference in policies, it puts us in really solid footing. And so I'm optimistic, but I'm optimistic because of what people like Cliff and all of the other organizations are doing, more so than I am in what the DNC or Biden are doing to help us get uh, Bashir reelected. I mean, Michael, um, Cliff is correct. They didn't actually say in the promo he was an Uncle Tom. They just simply <laughs> said Uncle Daniel. 
Right. Yeah. It, it's a it's a number of things here. Uh, no, they didn't say Uncle Tom, and Uncle Tom would be the incorrect word. That was actually Josiah Henson, who was a freedom fighter for black people. Sambo would be the correct term um, for Daniel Cameron if they wanted to be if they wanted to use that term, but they decided not to. Um, I, I watched the. I listened to the ad. Uh, the ad is not racist um, at all. What this is is a hit dog that's hollering, who's trying to deflect from his record and doesn't want to stand on his record, doesn't want to have to defend his record. So then he wants to call a black organization <clears throat> racist against him, but he continues to p push policies that are in opposition to African Americans. Now, for this, for the sake of accuracy, I don't support Daniel Cameron, don't support the majority of his policies, but I'm on his website right now, and I, I, I saw you talk about the better schools, strong economy, safe streets. You have to scroll down below that, and right before the video, he has a link. Click here to read Cameron's catch-up plan. So this is a five-page catch-up plan, and then if you scroll down below the video, he has two more links that go to PDFs that explain his policies, okay? Now, I don't agree with his policies, but just for the sake of accuracy, scroll down below those three bullet points. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, and now I've, I've been on his website, looking at his website, the other thing, and I don't know how deep you want to get into this, Roland, but he has his wife on the website as royal, and it says, meet Mackenzie, and then it talks about uh, moms for Daniel Cameron, things like this as well. And... You know, it's obvious uh, he's married to a white woman, too. OK, so once again, now she's on the website. They're talking about Meet McKenzie. <coughs> they're, they're talking about moms from McKenzie, things like this. So when you have anti-black behavior and an anti-black mentality and you support policies that are against African-Americans, that can spread to uh, numerous aspects of your life. And we unfortunately see this manifest here. First, Hopefully he's defeated. First, again, I don't give a damn who he's married to. I don't. I don't, I don't give a damn who he's married to. That's irrelevant to me. What I'm looking at is, and yeah, you could talk about uh, uh, clicking even further, but the reality is I did click. And I, he, got, he, only got three, he only got three issues on here. That's all he's got. Okay, you can go down below. I clicked, I clicked through it. You and the bottom line. Yeah, mm -hmm. he, oh, he still got three. Okay, in education, mm -hmm. he got sub points uh, under education, but that's it. At the end of the day, right. what he's doing, uh, Matt, is a typical Republican bumper sticker campaign. Uh, and, the, and and that's, that's what it boils down to. And so uh, I keep the focus on him, not his, not, not his wife. That's irrelevant to me. I'm looking at where he stands on issues that black people care about. And the reality is, on the issues, Andy Bashir is better on the issues that black folks care about than Daniel Cameron. Absolutely. And the, the problem here is the same kind of cognitive dissonance that we see all the time where particularly black conservatives try to play it both ways, right? Meaning they try to say, I'm black. So when it comes to us and it's advantageous for me to be black and play this black role, I try to have whatever proximity to blackness I can. But the rest of the time, I want you to recognize me as the one that got away from the plantation. We hear that kind of rhetoric all the time where black conservatives are trying to make it exceedingly clear that they're not a part of whatever they believe are black issues or issues that are seen to be not, you know, consonant with the conservative uh, ideal. And that's exactly what Daniel Cameron has done. And I, I like that this ad has been advanced the way that it has, because a lot of times, like Cliff said, I think masterfully, black people get um, accused of being monolithic, right? Accused of not being discerning in choosing their political uh, representatives and looking at the actual issues rather than looking at the person's skin. And this is a good example of saying you are not actually with us. No matter how you might try to do the song and dance where you think it helps you to be aligned with us, you choose against us all the time. And that's inherent in his policies. So I think that comparison of the policies is important. And I think that, you know, it is not only a bumper sticker campaign, but even the idea of, quote, you know, trying to stop wokeness. One of the problems I see with Cameron and a lot of other politicians is that they're really involved in things that should have no bearing on what their job is. If you're the attorney general or potentially the governor, there are certain spheres of influence you should have 
that don't necessarily concern certain uh, social issues. But where you do have the influence, i.e., you're the attorney general, and you can't find the evidence in your investigation that other law enforcement agencies have, then we have to ask why. And that's because you're acting in conformity with the ideology that is getting you where you want to go. And the reality with black conservatives is they very often play that tokenism role, and where it's helpful to them, they play it up. So you can't be surprised that on the back end, we call you out for you not being who you claim to be. And that's one of us, because we see how you act. And that is demonstrative of who you truly are. Yep. It's what you do is not what you say. That's what it boils down to. All right, hold tight one second. Uh, we come back. We're talking. We're going to talk about uh, again uh, recent polls that show um, where black voters are. Uh, we're seeing polling data shows that uh, African Americans less identifying as Democrats. Not actually new information. Uh, that's been the case really the last several election cycles. Uh, but really, what is going to need to happen to turn black folks out in significant ways uh, in next year's election? We'll discuss that. Uh, coming up next, you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Blackstone Network. Next on the Black Table with me, Craig Carr. Immigrants lured off Texas streets and shipped to places like Martha's Vineyard and Washington, D.C. Believe it or not, we've seen it all before. You people in the North, you're so sympathetic to black people, you take them. 60 years ago, they called it the reverse freedom rides. Back then, Southern governors shipped black people north with the false promise of jobs and a better life. It's a part of a well-known playbook being brought back to life. So what's next? That's next on The Black Table, a conversation with Dr. Gerald Horn about this issue of the reverse freedom rides right here on the Black Star Network. hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a back. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. There's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. It's your man Dion Cole from Blackish, and you watch Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks, uh, the recent Louisiana uh, primary shows black folks are simply not showing up at the polls like they did when Barack Obama ran for president in 2008. That's no shock. Uh, the reality is uh, many people expected that. But if you look at 2010, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 20, 22, uh, you've seen uh, that number go down. My next guest has been researching why mobilizing black voter post-Obama has been so difficult. Joining me from Sacramento, California, is Christopher Tyler, the director of the Black Voter Project and co-founder of Black Insights Research. Uh, Victor, glad to have me, glad to have you on the show. Um, what's the, um, uh, the top uh, points of your research? So, as you mentioned, it's no surprise black turnout is down and has been down since 2012. Um, I have a slide that shows really the drop in voter turnout over the last um, 10 years now it's been. So from 2012 to 2016, we've seen differences in upwards of 
uh, voter turnout nationally and even larger differences across some of the most important battleground states. And those differences continue, continue to persist from 2016 to 2020. And this comes from data from the Center for American Progress, um, suggesting that there's a ways to go to get black folk out to the polls at the same rates as they were during the Obama, Obama administration, and the, the Democrats are falling behind there. Um, another slide that I brought shows that this coming election in 2024, there are some significant gains to be made um, across um, congressional districts now, looking at Democrats regaining the House here. Um, there are significant districts with large percent African-American that are swing districts, right? And here you see in North Carolina, New York, Ohio, districts that are going to go suggested to go <coughs> one way or another Democrat or Republican just by a few points here. And then we look at Louisiana, right, which we were just talking about, um, another swing district there that's over 30 percent black. So there's a, a lot that can be done, but the Democrats really aren't doing what needs to be done or haven't in the last decade or so. Um, the research that I've conducted is looking at ways to get Democrats out to the polls, one of which being to really identify the threats to democracy, the threats to racial progress. Um, in this case, it's going to be Donald Trump. It's going to be the MAGA Republicans. It might even be some of these institutions that have now seemed to turn against racial progress in the black community, uh, specifically the Supreme Court, possibly even police, um, institutions of law enforcement. And my research suggests that identifying these institutions as a threat to the community is one of the most significant ways to get black folks to care about politics, to feel it's important to turn out to politics and to get out there and vote. So, again, so when you begin to unpack this here, and I'm going to throw this out, uh, and this is obviously going to tick off some of our people, uh, but they'll get the hell over it. And, and I've been saying this for a very long time here. Um, when Obama ran in 2008, he did not need the political infrastructure that had been in place in the Democratic Party since Reverend Jackson's run in 84 and 88. In 1988, Reverend Jackson, at his insistence, uh, with the installation of Ron Brown as DNC chair, with the work of the late Dr. Ron Walters, with the work of Harold Ickes and others, they actually created an infrastructure that was in place, a funding infrastructure, um, uh, you name it. When Obama runs, he doesn't need it. Um, you, had, uh, you had where uh, Pluff, David Pluff, David Axelrod, determined that what they didn't need to spend money uh, on black infrastructure, black-owned media, things along those lines, because, frankly, they already had the votes. Same thing happened in 2012. We saw, we saw the dismantling of also the DNC's political infrastructure with Obama for America, which then, uh, which then was created. And so you sort of had the DNC that was gutted, and then you had this third, this, this entity that he controlled. I was, I kept saying then, hey y'all, he only gonna be there eight years. It's gonna folks, it's gonna be folks running after that, and. Ever since, since he left in 2017, they have been trying to repair all of the damage that was caused by completely saying, we don't need that infrastructure. Your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think you're onto something there. The, the Democrats really did take advantage of and kind of take for granted the turnout that they got from black voters during the Obama administration. Um, there's a long line of literature that suggests the first of any when it comes to political representation creates extreme levels of enthusiasm. Um, the hope and change sort of mantra played on that. And black folk turned out in droves at historic rates to elect Barack Obama. Um, research shown in 2012, right, black turnout for the first time in American history since we started recording turnout in the 1940s and 50s surpassed white turnout levels under um, as people came out to vote for Obama. And so I think it was sort of taken for granted that this first, this American president, changed the way that um, the political spectrum looked with black turnout at such high levels in states like North Carolina, Virginia, um, Ohio, Michigan, these swing states that have significant black populations but aren't overwhelmingly black, went Democrat rather easily along with the high turnout rates in general across the country. Um, we fast forward to 2016, 2020. 
this excitement, especially among the black community, had tapered off and fallen off. And the Democrats were no longer sort of riding this wave of historic black turnout, but as you mentioned, had not yet decided to reinvest and reinvigorate their um, democratic machine in ways that were needed, right? And we see statewide levels such as Abrams campaign working to do this um, in places such as Georgia, but on a national scale and in as many battleground states as are needed to maintain the Obama coalition from 2008 and 2012 was nowhere to be found. And it's really not going to be found again, because who knows when we're going to have another candidate that we can consider a first, maybe possibly a black woman candidate what? that will fire the black community in similar ways. But but here's the deal, and, I, and I'll say this here, I, and I, I have been very clear on this, and again, I've been saying this for years, um, and that is whoever, who, if anybody who's black running, they cannot use the exact same playbook that Obama used, and here's what I mean by that. Um, there was a nine-point gap between black men and black women in, Bom in Obama's re-election with Romney in 2012. That was some dissatisfaction there. Whether we, whether we want to own it or not, there were a lot of people who felt that more could have been done. And so part of the issue that Democrats have, to, that, 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 that black candidates are gonna have to deal with, uh, and again, I believe that Senator Cory Booker and Senator Kamala Harris tried to use the Obama playbook when they ran for president in 2020. That sucker didn't work. It didn't work. And so, guess what? It's been used one time, it ain't gonna work again. Black voters are gonna be making demands uh, of any black candidate because they're gonna say, hey, we see how we voted uh, for Obama. That's just, uh, that's just a, a, a fact. And so, I think that people have to understand the newness, the first time seeing the first black family, blah, blah, blah. As I kept saying, hey, guess what? We stayed at the inauguration parade for eight years, everybody else left, and they actually got to work. And so, uh, and so Democrats cannot sit around and go, hey, where is the second black hope or turn them out? What has to happen here, and, and I've, again, I've been very clear on this, and a lot of other people get mad when I say it on these uh, mainstream media shows, Christopher, and I'm gonna be, I'm gonna talk slowly when I say this. The fundamental problem with the Democratic Party today is white media consultants refuse to listen to black people, listen to black consultants, listen to black pollsters, refuse to put the resources in those places early, and then they expect black people to come save their asses come mid to late October. I, I mean, you said it perfectly. I think one of the most recent sort of research experiments we put together speaks to this. Um, we ran what's called a conjoint experiment on a national poll of black folk. This is something that I don't know if has ever been done before, where we asked um, respondents, this is only black respondents, to select between two candidates as we varied the different characteristics of those candidates. And so if, if um, the last slide, I brought um, some slides, the last slide could be put up. What we found is that of those candidates, here are sort of the characteristics that were seen, shown to be the most important when it came to selecting a candidate for black respondents on a national poll, right? And so, of course, they wanted a black person, um, wanted a female candidate, wanted someone who was middle-aged, around 85, with eight years of um, experience in politics, um, picked someone who's a state legislator compared to some other occupations, um, was important that someone was an ally of the Black Lives Matter movement, actually preferred someone endorsed by Sanders rather than endorsed by um, Biden and preferred someone who uh, was a veteran. And so as you see on the left side here of the, the findings, right, the most important factors here when deciding between potential candidates was someone's support for Black Lives Matter, someone's race, and someone's years in politics. And so trying to build that perfect candidate is going to be a really hard sell, and it's going to be really difficult for Democrats to find someone who fits that same mold, if not impossible, as you mentioned, right? And so I'm really encouraging, through my research, other ways to look at turning black folk out. And one of the most important um, factors, aside from sort of this Obama factor, this great hope factor, is actually threat. And looking at how perceptions of threat 
can push people to the polls in lieu of this sort of magical candidate that creates the same inspiration that we saw once um, during the Obama administration. Well, first of all, the uh, the data of Terrence Woodbury, the pollster, actually uh, uh, bolsters that uh, in terms of what he says is that when they run when they run their focus groups, when when black people are told that your vote can make the difference between winning and losing, that it actually works. His data also says that there are certain phrases you cannot use for younger black voters today. When a younger black voter hears voter suppression, they automatically go back to the 1960s. That's what they think. He said, but when you are specific about saying they are trying to shut down our early voting locations, they're trying to get rid of ballot drop boxes, they're trying to stop us uh, from voting absentee balloting, he said that resonates much differently. Uh, but, but I, I want to stay on this whole point about uh, the white consultants, uh, because we have experience with that. We have experienced when we tried to uh, put in our plan, put in our plans uh, in 2016, 2020, uh, and the white consultants uh, wanted to give us a pittance of the money. Uh, and in fact, what happened in 2020, uh, as opposed so as opposed to provide giving us advertising money in the Warnock and Ossoff runoff, this is the D DSCC, uh, controlled by Senator Chuck Schumer, they, gave, they actually gave us money from the celebrity influencer budget. And so we were like, I'm sorry. And other uh, African Americans said, wait a minute, Roland has a media company. This is a media company. This is not a celebrity influencer. But what happens, if people need to understand the nuts and bolts, those white consultants, especially the media people, they make their money off of TV buys. And so they don't want that money to go in a ground game and non-television because that's less money goes in their pockets. And when the election is over and the candidate loses, they just go on to the next campaign to make more millions. And so there has to be a true reckoning, I believe, not just, and this is the, all the mistake that people keep making, what Jamie doing? People don't realize today the DNC does not take in a lot of money. The reality today with super PACs and things along those lines, DSC is taking in less money. So he's not controlling this apparatus. We're talking about the Democratic National Committee, the Democratic Governors Association, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee. We're talking about American priorities, all of those PACs. We're talking Emily's List. We're talking the, the environmental lobby. We're talking all of these groups where the billions are being spent. The fact of the matter is very few of them, including, uh, including uh, the uh, pro-choice folks, a lot of them are not making black folks a primary pro, pro, primary pro, a priority and putting the resources uh, behind it. They're paying lip service, and that's why you see the turnout that you're seeing. No, I agree. I think that making black folks a priority in more than just sort of this ancillary spending is gonna gonna have to take place for Democrats to have the same wins and gains that they expect or that they want and that we saw during, you know, 2008, 2012 elections and the midterms there um, between. When you, when you talked about some of these other pollsters and some of the findings they have and, you know, as their work sometimes falls back into to these traditional tropes of, well, if we just tell people what the Democrats are doing and we explain to them that the Democrats are working to their benefit, they will turn out and vote. And there has been some evidence of that that's the case. But when we conducted our own focus groups, we found that especially among low propensity voters or the, the black voters that are the hardest to turn out, they have very little faith in the Democratic Party at all. They, they hardly recognize Democratic leaders, even black Democratic leaders, and have low, low levels of political information. But the one topic that resonates the most with them is the Republicans, is Trump, is MAGA, is the threat that the GOP has. This is what got them out of their chairs, got them talking, got them interested in politics again. And so, you know, uh, from my own research and from the research that I've done with my firms and with my um, polling project, we, we're really pushing away from sort of these traditional, well, we just have to sell people on the Democratic Party right now, especially for black folk. That's that's not shown to be productive. No. We have push people towards, okay, if you don't vote, if you don't turn out and vote and specifically vote for Democrats, the um, outcome 
that Republicans are going to put in place, something that we're kind of seeing in Louisiana after the recent election there, is going to be far, far worse than you ever imagined. Right. And, and, that, and that's, that's what I call connecting the dots. And I try to spend a lot of time walking people through policy decisions. This is what the policies are going to look like if a Republican House is in charge, a Senate or in the Oval Office, compared to when there's a Democrat. And again, I tell people, I don't fall in love with candidates. I fall in love with policies. And I'm looking at what is the policy outcome. And also, I can't look at a singular policy. Look, there are some people out there, they only vote based upon the issue of abortion, whether you're anti-abortion, whether you are pro-choice. Not me. I got to look at a multitude of issues uh, because in terms, in terms of how I examine. I, I'm going to go to a break. We're going to come back and pick up on this because it's something else uh, that I want to get at that people need to understand when we start talking about people who self-identify because that's part of the conversation as well. There are a lot of black people, especially younger black people, 50 and under, really, especially 45 and under, who are not self-identifying as Democrat. And so what do, must Democrats do? They got to change how they target black voters and that one size fit all, that sucker don't work anymore. So we'll discuss that next right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. I'm Faraji Muhammad, live from L.A., and this is The Culture. The Culture is a two-way conversation. You and me, we talk about the stories, politics, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. So join our community every day at 3 p.m. Eastern and let your voice be heard. Hey, we're all in this together, so let's talk about it and see what kind of trouble we can get into. It's The Culture, weekdays at 3, only on the Black Star Network. I'm Dee Barnes, and next on The Frequency, we talk to award-winning screenwriter and director Chanel Dupree about her film, You Think You've Grown, The Adultification of Young Black Girls. This is a conversation that all women can relate to. This woman was like, oh my God, you know, I, I went through this when I was a kid. She wore something, it was a maxi dress, but the way it fit on her body, this uh, female teacher thought that she looked too grown and spun her around in front of a male teacher and said, "What do you, do you think she looks grown, right? Oh, my God. So that's next time on The Frequency on the Black Star Network. Don't you think it's time to get wealthy? I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show on the Black Star Network focuses on the things your financial advisor or bank isn't telling you. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. Hello, I'm Paula J. Parker. Judy Proud on The Proud Family. Louder and Prouder on Disney Plus. And you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. So I, I paid attention to the self-identification aspect of black voters for the last uh, 35 years. Um, I, I began to see and hear it when I was in college. So I was at Texas A&M from 1987 to 1991. And there, through the conversations I was having with classmates, I was hearing how they were not self-identifying as Democrats, like our parents. And so that doesn't mean that they weren't voting Democrat or heavily leaning Democrat, 
they were not self-identifying. Well, in the past 35 years, that number has only grown. I saw some data yesterday in North Carolina. An increasing number of African Americans are now calling themselves independent as opposed to checking off Democrat. Christopher, the reason that is important is because when you start now examining demographics, meaning age groups, and you now start examining where a black voter is in 2023 compared to a black voter in 1983, the strategy has to change. What I mean by that is there has to be more micro-targeting. Uh, to, and when, when, um, when uh, Andrew Gillum, when he lost in Florida, governor, he lost about 30,000 votes, exit polling data showed that 18% of black women have voted for Ron DeSantis. Some people say, well, that was unreliable, the exit poll data, but here's what we knew. A lot of those black women were voting based upon the opportunity scholarships that were in Florida for their children to go to different schools, in charter schools, school choice. That was an issue. We see that there are African Americans who are very much about, we ranted a woman in Georgia in 2022 uh, when Warnock was in a runoff. And she said, listen, I'm a woman. And the issue of Roe v. Wade is important. She said, but I ain't having no kids. She said, but I own a business. And so taxes is more important to me than being than Roe v. Wade. And so this was a black woman. And so I, all, I, think, so I think a part of this deal also is that these white Democratic strategists are going to have to wake up and realize that one size fit all don't work anymore. They're, you're going to have to have apps micro-targeting to black voters in a way that historically they've never had to do. No, Roland, you're absolutely right. We've The conversations we've had about our research with Democratic campaigns and organizations boils down to the fact that in order to make this type of campaign strategy work, it's not going to be a one-glove-fits-all. It's going to have to be targeted based on census tracts, based on neighborhoods, and you're going to have to put money into advertising that you traditionally wouldn't do or that these campaigns might not have been planning to do from the beginning. And in doing so, that's, that's how you're going to get black voters to turn out at the numbers that we saw in 2008 and 2012. And that's really the only way to do it, because a lot of these campaigns are also worried that as they continue to push possibly some of these messages towards black voters, they're going to turn off other parts of the constituency. And, and that's really where um, they get hung up in what, what direction do we go, right? Do we continue to push forward with the same um, campaign strategies that we've been doing for the last decade, or do we try something new and actually try to target black voters and mobilize, but they always come back to this, well, we have limited resources. Well, we're not sure exactly how that's going to affect the, the total um, base. We're not sure exactly how that's going to affect all the voters. And it's, it's exactly like you're saying, if, if there's not a very strategic um, targeted campaign for black voters, not just based even on statewide scale, but on um, district and neighborhood scales, it's going to be very difficult to get black voters out at the rates that these campaigns need in order to win some of these close elections. Uh, and before I go to my panel, this is very basic for Democrat. Okay, the, all those consultants could say whatever the hell they want to say, that's all cute. Here's what we know, and these are facts. The number one <clears throat> ranked group who vote Democrat are black women. The number two group, black men. That's one and two. Now, in their minds, oh, well, we're going to get their votes. You might get the vote based upon percentage. The problem that we're talking about is turnout, the intensity of the vote. And what I have been saying on this show is that if black people turn out at 65, 70, and 75 percent of our capacity, we can sweep elections, but that ain't going to happen if you do not have folks who are targeting them and putting the dollars behind them. Question for my panels. Matt Manning, you're first. Yeah, so the question I had for you was particularly about um, political trust and alienation. I know one of the things that you've looked at in your data is that issue, is political trust. And that, to me, seems to be the, the seminal issue here, no matter how people identify as Republicans or Democrats. 
And so my question to you is really twofold. One, how do you compile that data in terms of, you know, determining how trusting people are into the system or not? And secondly, what is your suggestion in terms of messaging, particularly for Democrats, uh, on how people can have a greater trust, black people have a greater trust in the system and therefore a greater buy-in, particularly when it comes to things like nonpartisan races, because a lot of times on the local level, your local city council person doesn't even declare a party, right? And they're the one who has the most immediate effect on your life in terms of filling the pothole at the end of the street. So how do y'all address the political trust and alienation issue in your data? That's a great question. I, we've been looking at trust and alienation for probably about 10 years years now, because we, we consider it also something essential to understanding black politics. When it comes to trust, we, we really break it down into what's called specific and diffuse trust, where specific trust is trust in sort of the temporary political figures, political symbols, what's going on in politics at that moment, where diffuse trust is really this broader trust in systems and in institutions. And for black, over time, We've shown, we, we know that diffuse trust is always relatively low compared to other groups just because of the history of discrimination and oppression that black folk have, have lived through. And so it's, it's always been a struggle to get that level of diffuse trust up. However, um, our research and other research suggests that trust can be built, specific and diffuse trust, through representation that looks like the community and through substantive policy gains. However, it's going to be very difficult to get that type of representation and to achieve any policy gains for the black community with turnout, not at historic rates, at these levels that we're talking about, right? And so that's why we continue to push forward. Well, if long term we really want to build trust, we have to understand that there needs to be a very committed campaign to turning out black voters that's looking at new and unique strategies to do so, especially after the Obama era, because the only way that we're going to regain this trust in, this, in the system and sort of rebuild allegiance to a system that many black folks see as oppositional is by showing them that they can win races, they can be represented by people that they believe in, that they look like, and those people can then turn around and pass policy, create legislation that substantively benefits them in the long haul. And so, you know, that's kind of our, our short and long when it comes to trust and alienation. But we absolutely agree this is a central issue to black politics and something that we've been researching for a while. Um, Michael. Hey, Dr. Chris. Uh, thanks for coming on today. I've been to your website. You have a lot of good information there. Um, we just spoke with Cliff Albright from Black uh, Voters Matter. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had Omari Hosang, Hosang on from Black Voters Matter in Louisiana. How can we um, create and increase a Black political infrastructure that can message to African Americans, educate us politically, educate us on the uh, issues, the policies, and help turn out the African-American vote. Uh, I do agree that the Democratic Party has to do a better job in messaging. But at the same time, I think this is about self-preservation for African-Americans. And we ha I think we have to take more control of our own destiny. destiny and I don't think we can rely on the Democratic Party. We can use them as a tool, but can't look at them as a savior. How can we create a, a, a greater black political infrastructure? I think, I think that's a great question and something that clearly we've been struggling with for decades now, how to create some sort of infrastructure that's self-sufficient and that doesn't rely on the Democratic Party or any party, therefore, to, to win elections or to pass legislation. I, the, to me, the first step is um, education and to, to really civic education and an understanding of politics and the importance of politics in people's lives. From our focus groups, from our research, we found that most people see politics as a periphery issue and that there's things such as paying rent, getting to work, getting their kids to school, dealing with health care issues, right, that they don't necessarily see as inherently political, but more as everyday survival issues that take up most of their attention. And so in order to move towards a system of infrastructure within the black community where we have sort of community level support, individual level support that doesn't rely upon these political parties, we have to continue to find ways to educate people um, and to push people into a politicization that in which they believe that politics is just as essential, is just an essential part of else that they're dealing with. Um, 
We kind of have unique tools that have come about in the last five, five or 10 years, right? We have social media now and ways to telecommunicate with people that we've never had before. And so I think we need to continue to experiment with these and, and find creative ways to use the limited funding that many of our community organizations have to reach as many people as possible and sort of inform them of the importance of politics and building networks um, and building channels and organizations that bring people together with an understanding that politics needs to be something that they consider as an important element of their everyday life and it's intertwined with everything they do. But again, this this is not like I'm I'm trying to be careful here and not talk about it as something simple, right, that we should have done already. This is it's a very, very difficult hill to climb and it's it's probably gonna take um a a sort of nationwide organization to do it. And we've seen a, li a little bit of that, right, in the wake of Trayvon Martin and some of the um, the police killings over the last decade, um, the way that social media and the Internet and some of these new technologies can be used to mobilize people. But there's still a gap between getting the information to people and actually building that infrastructure, right, infrastructure similar to what we see maybe in a civil rights movement, right, where it was necessary to go door to door and to talk to people. And so we, we kind of have to rely upon some of these old tactics of, of building, bringing people together along with possibly using some of the new technology we have. But again, it's, it's a really great question and, and another tough answer, right? None of these are easy questions. Well, before I go to Omicongo, before I go to Omicongo I'm going to uh, speak to that. And, uh, and this is what it's, going, what it's going to have to take. It is, and again, let me be very clear. We're going to have to sit here, and we're going to go back to the other shot. We're going to have to sit here and be very clear. We have, to, we have to actually put a number to it and get black folks to understand that this shit ain't free. Let me say right. it. Let me, let me say this again for all the folk who are watching, listening. The shit ain't free. The work ain't free. Uh, and so the work that Christopher's doing, the work that uh, Cliff Albright and Black Voters Matter and Latasha Brown, the work that uh, Georgia Stand Up, all these different groups, the work that this stuff ain't free. And so it's a lot of people who spend their time out there talking about we need this and we need that and we need this and we should be doing that and we should be doing this here. And I'm sure Christopher, he, he hears all this sort of stuff and then you're sitting there going, okay, but where are you, are you putting your money where your mouth is? And so that, that, is, that is what it takes. I have said to uh, folks on this show, hey, stop sending money to candidates and the parties and send it to third party groups because you know the money's going to get on the ground what is actually needed because I'm going to say it again. And this is the problem. And we're going to talk about it in our next segment. Christopher, you know this here. These white consultants, they want to dump everything on television. Bring up Christopher, y'all. Come on, please. They want to dump everything on television. They want to keep putting everything on television, and it reaches a point where you have total saturation. And the reality is, people are like, man, turn that crap off. Turn it off. Turn it off. You have to put money on the ground. You have to look at the numbers and then go, okay, and your, as your research shows, huh, okay, in this particular state, in this region of the state, Inside of this region of the state, this is what this city and town did. And now that I'm breaking down the city and town, now I'm breaking down the precincts in that city and town. So now it's, oh, okay, this precinct here had 1,000 eligible voters, but only 120 actually voted. Okay, target people and resources to knock on those doors to at least get that number from 120 up to 500. And now target this precinct and this precinct and this precinct. One, that requires money. That requires people. And if you don't have that, then you're stuck hoping a campaign comes around to do it. And from what we've known, campaigns aren't doing that, right? The Precisely. The most successful campaigns we've seen turning out black folks since the Obama era have been state, regional, or local campaigns, such as the Black Voter Matters, such as the um, campaigns in Georgia that are doing it sort of on their own, sometimes in coordination with parties, but most of the infrastructure is built over time on their own with their own resources that they've been able to gather. Absolutely. Uh, Omicongo. Uh, Mr. Tyler, uh, Tyler, I was really in, in interested in your slide showing the prototype in terms of what people were interested in. And given the fact that you have Black Lives Matter as the top priority for many people that you're speaking to, 
How do you, are you concerned that Democrats are going to be losing serious support, even more support from the black community as it relates to Biden's stance with Israel and Gaza? Because what I'm seeing is that many black people who are, are in support of, of Palestine or at the very least are in support of a ceasefire. And I'm concerned, as I'm also seeing from like the Arab American community, they're saying that we're just getting lip service from the administration, and though we're never going to go vote for Trump, we're so angry with what's going on right now that we just might end up staying home. And that might be a concern for the black community as well. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's absolutely a, a concern. So just to be clear, the experiment that I put up was juxtapositioning characteristics when it came to perspectives on Black Lives Matter. And so for us, the ideal candidate... Um, was an ally of Black Lives Matter, but this was compared to someone who did not show support or said they were not an ally of Black Lives Matter. So it doesn't necessarily say they're affiliated or anything, but their opinion on Black Lives Matter was one of the most important elements when understanding what made Black um, respondents choose one candidate over another. And so, you know, the the fact that the Democratic Party has not necessarily See, put position themselves as an ally of the black community in many ways, right? But most recently, when it comes to this, um, the conflict in Israel and Palestine in the Middle East, it's it's definitely a worry and a concern that black voters will continue to lose even more enthusiasm. And, and now we're talking about possibly some high propensity black voters or black voters that were planning on coming out and voting and have consistently voted are now being turned off even more. Um, and there's there's absolutely a reason to believe that. You know, from our focus groups, black voters and low and high propensity black voters were already disillusioned with Democrats. They already didn't really see much in terms of policy returns from the party. They didn't recognize any individual changes in their lives since Biden had won in 2020. And so anything like this that can suggest sort of that um, the Democrat Party's intentions or attention is diverted somewhere else, rather than continuing to try and work for, as Roland put, the base of voters that are the most supportive of the, of the party can turn people off very quickly. And so, you know, <coughs> you can see how the conflict unfolds over the next year, possibly over the next um, few months. But there's absolutely the, the potential here for black people in America to view um, Biden's sort of support of Israel as something negative for the black community and something sort of... <coughs> um, <coughs> prioritizing international affairs over what could be done for black folk at home. Uh, Christopher uh, Tyler, we surely appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Folks, hold tight one second. What is going to be done when it comes to reaching black male voters? We'll discuss that next right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. All right, folks. They try to kill that music, guys. Kill the music. Thank you. All right. Curl Prep Natural Hair Solutions. It's an amazing uh, organic uh, product, folks. Uh, Two-step curl defining system for women, men, and children. Now, look at this video here, and you can be the judge. Folks are lining up to see the product in action at various hair shows, and when they take a seat to try it, they don't believe it's actually their hair. Now, you can buy the product at curlprep.com. Again, it's curlprep, C-U-R-L-P-R-E-P.com. It works in all types of hair. Use the code ROLAND, lowercase letters, of course, to get a 20% discount. It's just simply two steps. They have sweet butter and sweet defining gel, both at curlprep.com. And of course, parents, you can remove the ouch. Y'all know what that's all about. Uh, you will love the system because you can comb through, comb the product through your child's hair with their with your fingers. Seasoned Saints, they also love the product and the line has products 
They look great for twists, braids, locks, weaves, even those wigs and extensions. It's all at curlprep.com. Again, use the code ROLAND, lowercase letters, to get a 20% discount. You won't believe it's your hair. I'm Faraji Muhammad, live from L.A., and this is The Culture. The Culture is a two-way conversation. You and me, we talk about the stories, politics, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. So join our community every day at 3 p.m. Eastern and let your voice be heard. Hey, we're all in this together, so let's talk about it and see what kind of trouble we can get into. It's The Culture, weekdays at 3, only on the Black Star Network. Me, Sherry Shepard, and you know what you're watching, Roland Martin Unfiltered. Well, I was talking to Terrence Woodbury. His research last year showed that black male voter turnout in North Carolina played a role in the Republican keeping his United States Senate seat. Yeah, that's the actual data. So part of the thing when you hear people talk about, oh, what's happening with black male voters, is you have to understand this is not a national issue, but it also depends on critical states. We also heard uh, the myth that black men were not voting for Stacey uh, Abrams. Well, after the election, the data was parsed and that simply wasn't true. That was a fallacy that was being promoted, but it wasn't factual. So the question is, how do you also get black men to, one, register, two, turn out, and then the question is, who do they vote for? Dr. Wes Bellamy is the chair of advocacy at 100 Black Men of America. He joins us from Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, Wes, glad to have you here. Let's talk about that because you heard me say earlier, you have to have different targeted strategies for different people. If Democrats are going to target black men, you better have a specific targeting of them that's different from black women. Wes, all right, uh, okay, Wes, I think your video froze there. We got your back, go ahead. There we go. So, one, thanks so much for having me, uh, good brother Roland. You are uh, one of my favorite. Actually, tell Layla to stop calling, please. There you go. I think I think we I think you, we unfroze. Go right ahead. Start again. I was saying thank you so much for having me, good brother. You, you're one of my favorite alphas, and that's where the compliments are going to end. So. <laughs> <laughs> but in all seriousness, uh, I appreciate you having us on today. So you're absolutely right. Specifically, when you look at the 100 Black Men of America, some of the initiatives in which we're pushing, we're unveiling our Real Men Vote 2.0 campaign, in which across our 107 chapters across the country, we are looking to register every single brother that is in the 100 Black Men of America to vote. That's over 10,000 members who we are incentivizing them to be registered to vote, but then also we're kicking off a 30-city tour or if you will, uh, town halls, talking about the importance of brothers getting out the vote and then being educated on the issues within the localities in terms of who they should be voting for and what they should be looking for when it comes to uh, casting their ballot. One of the things that I think that we often see is, one, just be candid, uh, Politicians and elected officials, as a former elected official, people take the black male vote for granted. They'll only come around when election season is happening. We only see them have conversations about our issues with barbershop talks or come and talk with us brothers. And, and those those initiatives, those ways of going and reaching brothers, they may fit for a certain segment, but they don't fit for everyone. So I agree with you. There has to be a multi-tiered and multifaceted approach. And that's what we're looking to unveil with the 100 Black Men. I also see organizations organizations uh, like the Black Voters Project and others uh, looking at different strategies also uh, addressing and attacking uh, the black male vote. And I'm looking forward to not only collaborating with other entities, but us creating real, not only digital strategies, but strategies to fit a, a multitude of different brothers to engage us in the electoral process. Somebody asked me, they were asking me about this, uh, and um, <clears throat> it was a very interesting conversation because uh, I had to lay some things out that they didn't want to necessarily deal with. Mm -hmm. And this is what I said. Uh, and I said, let me be perfectly clear. 
Uh, I am astute enough to understand uh, the paternalism of the civil rights movement, of, mm -hmm. of the paternalism of this country, of misogyny in this country as well. There were a lot of people who made the assumption that men uh, were not supporting Hillary Clinton in 2016 because she was a woman. Uh, and then I had to take the people, folks back to the data to show black men the nine point gap between black men and black women with Obama and Romney in 2012. I said that was two men who, who were running. And so they then were like, well, I don't quite understand. I said, well, I'll give you an example. When Doug Jones won the special election in Alabama, every story, the entire storyline, black women elect Doug Jones. And it was at 96%. Oh. But 92% of black men supported Doug Jones. Uh -huh. And what I have heard from a lot of black men is that all they've heard is black girl magic, black girl magic, black girl magic, black girl magic, as if black men are also not voting. Now, are black women voting at a higher rate? Yes. But that, 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 that refrain is a turnoff to some black men who feel as if they are deemed irrelevant. Your thoughts? No, I, I would agree with you wholeheartedly, but I also would encourage our brothers to understand that we can't have our feelings hurt so easily when it comes to who's quote unquote getting the credit for saving the democracy. We have to do what we have to do regardless of who's being lauded for your voting here or the higher percentage turnout. But I also would, would encourage Democratic pundits, uh, Democratic analysts and so forth to put more resources into ensuring that black males, one, are not only registered to vote, but also that they feel appreciated in their vote. So, I mean, two things can be true. Brothers can't be so sensitive when it comes to uh, who's getting the credit for electing whom, but also there needs to be efforts and mechanisms made to ensure that we feel appreciated and valued when we do but, go out and vote. But, but, I, but, he, but I, I, I agree, and I absolutely agree with that, but perception does become reality. I agree. And, and we have to contend uh, with, with this reality as well, and that is when we're talking about um, uh, what they're hearing, and let's talk about the Biden administration. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, Biden talks about, I said I was going to put a black woman on the Supreme Court, and I did. Absolutely right. Should have happened. Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson Obama should have appointed a sister when he chose Merrick Garland. I was very clear on that. Mm -hmm. well, Biden talks about putting more black women on the appellate uh, courts than all presidents combined. But one of the things that I've said to the Biden administration, you don't have a prominent black male surrogate. Yes. And I'm like, when I, when I look, and again, I'm just being very clear. When I look at who was head of OMB, a sister, look at the vice president, sister, and let me be real clear, I'm not knocking any of that. But what I am saying, if you're the Biden-Harris administration and you're trying to reach black men, who are they sending out who's a brother who can talk to brothers? Well, I'm not here to cape. No, 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 Follow but me let me answer the question. Right, no, 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 right. I'm not caping question. for any party, but I'm giving yeah. an example of how campaigns right. and candidates need to understand your messengers are kind of important when you're trying to reach certain groups. Yeah, and I think the Biden administration would say when they send out a brother like the former mayor of Columbia, South Carolina, uh, Mayor Steve Benjamin, who's the head of African American engagement, when they would send out someone like Vince Evans, um, who's over running, helping uh, assist with the CBC and whatnot, they would, in my personal estimation, would say those are the persons who they're sending out to the black male community and saying you need to be engaged in some regard, the Antoine C. Rice of the world and so forth. Now, is that enough? Absolutely not. And you know, just like I know, there needs to be more resources, not only poured into um, advocating for black males to be engaged in the voting process, but courting black males to stay engaged and being educated on why they need to be voting and or supporting the Biden administration if they so choose to. Here's another thing, though, I think we have to be candid about. There are a ton of misinformation programs and initiatives that Absolutely. are Absolutely. 
And I cannot tell you how often I, I serve as the, the housing authority uh, chairman of chairman of the housing authority board where I live here in Charlottesville. I can't tell you how often when I'm in particular communities, how much misinformation is shared and how often I hear brothers now saying, you know, maybe I should take a look at the other side because they're supporting us in some regard because of some misinformation in which they've heard. Yep. So, so yes. There has to be resources, as you often allude to, being placed to specifically uh, court, as my grandmother would say, the black male vote. But I think collectively, black folk as a whole need not be taken for granted. And that's where you see organizations like the 100 Black Men and others, uh, the Urban League, NAACP, some of your legacy organizations, also new organizations like, again, uh, Black Youth Vote, Black Voters Matter, and so forth, putting in the work on the ground to ensure that our brothers are educated so that they can make a decision that best suits them. Uh, and, and again, I'm a firm believer that misinformation is able to take hold when you have an absence of counter information. Yes. So, yeah, so, and yet, we have to recognize that that is real, and Russia was very keen on spreading mm -hmm. misinformation, specifically targeting black people and black men uh, in 2020. Uh, questions from the panel? on Congo, you're first. Uh, it's great to talk to you, Dr. Bellamy. I'm a big supporter of, of, of your work. Uh, I have a question relating to the hip-hop community. One of my concerns as it relates to the black male vote is that I'm starting to see more rappers coming out in support of Trump. Um, I'm looking at uh, Kivo, Waka Flocka Flame, uh, Kodak Black, Sexy Red. And one of my concerns is that these are some of the people that are going to be driving away some of the youth uh, vote, particularly in, in our community, which also ties into the last segment. And on the same side, I'm not hearing enough from members of the hip hop community in, you know, that who are anti-Trump. What are mm -hmm. your thoughts as it relates to outreach, as it relates to the hip hop community? Well, uh, I actually posted about this on my Instagram page uh, a couple weeks ago, and I think it's something for us to pay a great deal of attention to. Sexy Red, as you alluded to, came out and stated that, well, yeah, in the hood, people love Trump. Yeah, we love Trump. We're riding with Trump. Trump sent us those checks. You heard a rapper like Lil Durk say in his, in his record, it's smash hit, All My Life with J. Cole, say people talk about those stimulus, but they really came through in the trenches. And a lot of folks, due to misinformation and not understanding that Congress, not the, the person 45, actually disseminated and sent the checks to the American people during the times of COVID. And, and because individuals aren't educated on how this process works and how uh, resources and stimulus resources, if you will, are actually put in the hands of our communities, because by and large, the Democratic Party doesn't do a good enough job of educating people on the ground or empowering power empowering or resourcing those who are on the ground to educate folks, then again, you have misinformation that's spread. So when it comes to the hip hop community as a whole, one, I don't think it's I don't think it's fair, quote unquote, not saying this is what you're saying, but I don't think it's fair for us to say that uh, we should be looking for rappers and entertainers to politically educate us, although they do have a voice. I would say that you have individuals like Jeezy, you have individuals like Jay-Z, you have individuals like Method Man and so forth, who have been vocal about the, the need for us to uh, be on the front lines and voting with our brains and not just the misinformation that we're receiving on social media. So there is some combating, it, but, uh, but, but we all know that on social media and the like, when, when a rapper or entertainer says that they're riding with Trump, that's going to drive their views through the roof. When you have someone like that Black, who, you know, shout out to Yak, and, you know, there's a lot of young folk who, who listen to his music, but that doesn't mean that they're going to be voting for him. And I say this all the time in Charlottesville. If someone like Kodak Black has more influence on the young people from a political standpoint than I do, a person who's been elected, a person who's been on the ground, who's interacting with my people on a day-to-day -day basis. If Kodak has more influence on the ground than me, that means that we're doing something wrong. Our young folks shouldn't be looking to entertainers for their political influence. We need to be more engaged on the ground to ensure that our people are educated to make the best decision. Uh, well, and let me ask also, but part of the issue is also Democrats got to learn how to take credit for shit. Uh, so what Democrats should yeah. be saying is, hold up, uh, we control the House, 
You ain't right. get none of them checks without us. Trump right. may have put his name on there, but we were the ones who you got yeah. them checks because of us. Just like I keep trying to tell all these people, oh, Trump let black men out of jail. Ain't no first step at unless it gets passed by the Democratic controlled House and that effort was being led by Congressman Hakeem Jeffries. Right, exactly. Those are, those are facts. Uh, Matt? Yeah, Dr. Bellamy, uh, thanks for joining us tonight. I mean, it seems to me the reality of it is if there's no price to pay for not reaching out to black men, then there will be no reach out to black men. So my question to you is what have you seen as points of leverage or fulcrums, if you will, to make not only the Democratic Party, but just the larger system care about black men being involved at all? And I can't imagine that they do. But to me, it seems like you respond to fear more than you do anything else. And if you're afraid that leaving us out is going to culminate in you losing elections, then that's where it seems a response would be. What are your thoughts in that respect? Well, I, I think that you're absolutely right. I mean, I think many parties and, and larger institutions who believe in which they're leading voter engagement initiatives try to lead with fear. But I think it's more important, just my personal opinion, it's more important for us to lead with education. It's more important for a certain uh, population of people to, to lead with empathy and showing them how the decisions that you make today have an impact on tomorrow. There's important for, for certain initiatives and for different populations to be led um, with whatever it takes to, to tap into what it is and the things in which they care about. But for, for me personally, I think that it's of the utmost importance for us to educate our brothers specifically on how important it is for us to vote on the local and state level first. Yep. When we can show them, when you go and vote for me in this local election, I can then help you specifically go and do this. When we make that connection, then we see a higher level of engagement. But the thing is, that requires work, not talking. That's not a panelist discussion. That's not something that you just do on social media. That requires you to go into our communities and talk to our people. And that's where I'm hoping that there will be more resources poured into us getting onto the ground to educate our brothers with other brothers who know better about why you have to be tapped in locally, because that's where everything starts. Yep. Michael? Hey, Dr. West Bellamy, this is a great conversation. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine, uh, Keith Williams, who's chairman of the Michigan Black Democratic Caucus. And he was mm -hmm. talking about how he was talking to, to African-American men in the neighborhoods here in the city of Detroit. And some of them said they were going to support Donald Trump because they want to own their own businesses. And mm -hmm. they see uh, they are under this illusion that if Trump is president, somehow he's going to help them uh, own their own business. Can you talk, can you dispel that myth and talk about efforts that the Biden Harris administration have made to help African American entrepreneurs and African American male entrepreneurs? Well, well sure. One, again, I'm not a surrogate, nor am I a representative oh, yes. for the Biden Harris administration. Let yes. me be clear. But I do think that there are a few things that, that we all can point to, or excuse me, that the administration can point to, and, and which that they've done to support black males as well as black folk as a whole on an economic um, and a business perspective. When you look at the amount of money, there, there, there literally have been hundreds of millions and hundreds of millions of dollars poured into different communities from this administration to support not only minority business initiatives, but MBE. Uh, uh, um, uh, I don't want to call them. Uh, well, I'm just not going to go there. there. There are different initiatives that have been placed from the administration to states to be able to get these monies uh, funneled into different communities. But here's where I think the problem lies. Uh, brothers don't know about the resources that are available. And why don't they know about the resources that are available? Because, as Roland alluded to, Democrats as a whole don't do a good enough job of talking about, one, here are the things that are here for you. And secondly, they do a very horrible job of this is what I have already done. So if people don't know what's out there and they don't know what you've done thus far, then of course they're going to believe any uh, uh, slim back with a red face and blonde hair that's been bleached to, to oblivia when he says, that, yeah, I've done this for you and you don't have anything to lose because I'm rich. Like, like, unfortunately, misinformation and hot takes, they land with a lot of communities who don't have information. So, again, the Biden-Harris administration, as Brother Roland alluded to, they have to do a better job of communicating not only what's out there, but the resources that are available to you. And that is only done 
on the ground by dealing and working with people on a day-to-day -day basis. You're in Detroit. I look at folks like New Era and, and the brother Big Zeke, who's been going around community to community and ensuring that these communities are safe, walking around with, with brothers who are armed and his, his colleagues, if you will, to say that we're going to stop the violence within our communities. If the Harris, excuse me, if the Biden-Harris administration wants to be able to get on the ground, then they have to not only work with brothers like Brother Williams, and shout out to Brother Keith and Brian Banks of the world, so we all have a great time at CBC, but they got to be willing to work with the big Zeeks of the world who are in the communities, in the trenches, on the day-to-day, -day, and who are ensuring that our people are not only safe, but these are trusted voices within our community. And again, I can't emphasize enough, specifically for black men, we're willing to trust other black men when we know that you're not going to do us wrong, but we can see your track record of leading us not astray, but into a place of prosperity, if you will. And those people, those persons don't always receive the resources, and that's where things have to change. Well, uh, what, what I keep laying out and it's very simple, folks, um, <coughs> you look at what is going to happen over the next year, not just the presidential election, U.S. Senate congressional races, but gubernatorial races, state house races. There are issues that specifically impact black people. And I don't care what anybody says, the Republican Party, if you look at how they're trying to screw black voters in Georgia, mm -hmm. Florida, Alabama, Louisiana, I can go North, on Carolina. On, North Carolina, Texas. Um, they ain't they ain't looking out for black folks. Let's just At be all. real clear. So that ain't this ain't. Oh my God, you're loving a party. No, I'm looking at facts. Every state I just named, they specifically have been trying to disenfranchise black voters. Mm -hmm. Every mm -hmm. single one. Those are facts, and I dare anybody on the right to try to dispute them. Wes, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you, my brother. Until next time. Yes, sir. Yo, yo. Uh, what, what, what the hell was that? <laughs> you know, I just had to let you know. I showed you some love initially, and like I said, yo, yo. Thanks for having me, good brother. Oh, what, what is that? Yo, I don't know what that that little uh, yo, yo. That, here, here we that, go. That, here but, we but, go. But, 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 but I get. I just say you did an okay job. That's what that means. This, <laughs> that sign means okay. All right. All right, uh, folks, we're going to be uh, in Richmond on Thursday with our next town hall with the House of Virginia Democrats. I uh, want you all to come on out. Virginia Union University, we're going to be on the yard. So I want everybody to show up to Virginia Union. Uh, we want to pack to join out, talking about uh, the local elections, what's happening, the state elections. And so we'll see you all 6 p.m. on Thursday at Virginia Union University. All right, folks, got to go to a break. We come back. More on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Be sure to join our brand. Funk fan club, so you're checking money order. P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 0196. Cash App, dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo's RM Unfiltered. Zale, rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. We'll be right back. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene. A white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. <laughs> White people are losing their damn minds. There's an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. on the black table with me, Greg Carr. Immigrants lured off Texas streets and shipped to places like Martha's Vineyard and Washington, D.C. Believe it or not, we've seen it all before. You people in the North, you're so sympathetic to black people, you take them. 60 years ago, they called it the reverse freedom rides. Back then, Southern governors shipped black people north 
with the false promise of jobs and a better life. It's a part of a well-known playbook being brought back to life. So what's next? That's next on The Black Table, a conversation with Dr. Gerald Horn about this issue of the Reverse Freedom Rides, right here on the Black Star Network. Hey, it's John Murray, the executive producer of the new Sherry Shepard Talk Show. You're watching Roland Mark Unfiltered. Anaya Burleson has been missing from Dal her Dallas home since June 25th. The 16-year-old is 5 feet 5 inches tall, weighs 185 pounds, with black hair and brown eyes. Any information about Anaya Burleson uh, should call the Dallas Police Department at 214-744-4444, 214-744-4444. A Pennsylvania judge reinstates all charges, including murder, against a former Philadelphia police officer who killed a man at point-blank range. Common Pleas Court Judge Lillian Ransom overturned Judge Wendy Pugh's ruling uh, regarding the facts of Mark Dial's case, and they should be established uh, at a trial. Dial is facing murder, manslaughter, official oppression, and four other charges for the August 14th shooting death of 27-year-old Eddie uh, Rizzeri during a traffic stop. Dial's lawyers say... Um, uh, he, he could have feared for his life because he thought Israel had a gun. They also say the murder charges require the presence of malice and there is not enough proof that Dow acted maliciously. Well, okay, that's what they always say. A Georgia man was arrested for making racially motivated threats and shooting at his black neighbor. According to court documents, Mark Wheeler, 73 years old, fired a 22 caliber revolver in the direction of the victim and the victim's dwelling while yelling racial slurs. Wheeler is accused of violating the Fair Housing Act's criminal provision barring a banning force or threat of force to intimidate or interfere with housing rights based on race. He was also charged with unlawful firearm using use while uh, committing that civil rights violation. If convicted, he faces a maximum penalty of 10 years in prison and a quarter of a million dollar fine for both the civil rights and firearm charges. A federal district court judge will determine uh, after any sentence after considering the U.S. sentencing guidelines and other statutory factors. Three former Mississippi Department of Corrections officers have been sentenced for using excessive force against an inmate. Uh, Jessica Hill and LaToya Richardson, uh, along with case manager Nicole Moore, pled guilty to the July 11, 2019 incident that happened at the Central Mississippi Correctional Facility where the trio assaulted a defenseless inmate while she was in the fetal position. Hill was sentenced to three years and one month in prison, two years of uh, a supervised release and a $1,500 fine. Richardson was sentenced to three years and one month in prison, two years of supervised release, and a $1,500 fine. Moore was sentenced to two years in prison, two years of supervised release, and a $1,500 fine. Boy, that, that must be something there, Matt, for you to be prison guards, not your ass in prison. <laughs> yeah, that is something. And I have a case that I'm going to be trying in Houston, actually, in, in April that's not exactly th this set of facts, but it's it, it revolves around the same issue about... Uh, inmates' treatment by uh, prison guards, and it's it's tragic what happens in a lot of prisons and how often it goes unaccounted for. So I'm glad that here the Department of Justice again knocked it out of the park and holding people accountable because you know the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution says no cruel and unusual punishment, and very often people think that you know inmates don't have rights. So this is good because when people go to prison, they are still people who are still deserving of protection, irrespective of what put them in prison, right? So I'm glad that the Department of Justice here held these women accountable because them attacking an inmate is not only unconscionable, but it's especially unconscionable when the person is not fighting back, when you're in the fetal position. Um, so it's important that they continue to hold people like this to task, and I'm glad that they did. I swear, I, I can't tell you how many times we keep seeing the DOJ do this on Macongo uh, and White House. Y'all might want to take credit for this stuff. 
Yo, I mean, they got they got, they can't just keep having these little press releases on like you know X or Twitter and these little websites that nobody's reading because this is another major victory. I mean, we just when you talked about the couple of days ago with the whole redlining decision as well, this Justice Department has been very, you know we think we always feel like they move too slowly, but when they strike, they strike and they strike hard. And this is also very important because the only time we outside of the Black Star Network, which is why I'm so thankful for the Black Star network, the only time we've heard about terrible conditions in prisons and what's happening of inmates is when Trump and his minions started to turn themselves in in Georgia. And they barely talked about the conditions there on a regular basis. Every single day in our prisons, our people are suffering in situations like this. They're dying in prison, being e eaten alive by bugs. And we can't just act like this stuff isn't happening. And so I appreciate the fact that the Justice Department is going at it. We need to publicize this more because these prison guards, they should start being on notice if they haven't been already that this Justice Department, they may move slowly, but eventually they are going to get you. Mike? Michael? Yeah, Roland, uh, once again, this is another win for the uh, Department of Justice and Kristen Clark as well. Uh, they have to be more vocal and inform um, people about the win, especially the African-American community. Uh, the lives of people in prison they they do have rights there. You are in the um, you, you are still supposed to be protected even in prison, and you should definitely not be abused uh, by prison guards. So um, once again, this is them holding people uh, accountable, and I would not want to be uh, those prison guards either. Uh, hell no! <laughs> but they about to learn what it feels like. Gentlemen, I appreciate y'all joining us today's show. Matt, I'm a Congo. Michael, thank you so very much. Folks, last weekend, I was uh, in Atlanta. Had a couple of events there. And last Saturday, I decided to stop by the homecoming at Clark Atlanta University. Uh, we uh, had a good time there. Uh, guys, what are y'all doing? You, the video, what are you doing? Thank you. Started from the beginning. All right, so um, had a good time there. So just want to give y'all a sense of what it was like uh, strolling through uh, the homecoming at Clark Atlanta. Check this out.
bringing your dog to the game. First off, my son is the quarterback. I'm a music artist, Jay Nicole, and her name is Hollywood. Thank you, sir. Really, your dog is named Hollywood? My dog's name is Hollywood. Pass incomplete. How you gonna bring your dog to the game? Because Joseph Douglas said to the receiver on the play. She ain't the mascot, that's a dog. Gives the ball to Central State, first down to 10. That's a dog. Well, this is my dog. You bougie black people, y'all just, look at, dogs belong outside. You wouldn't have it no other way, baby. She go to every game, ain't never miss a game. Oh, Lord.
Nah, so it's this. It's this right here. How you doing, my What's man? What's going on? Y'all good? Yeah, man. What's up, bro? I uh, appreciate it. Appreciate it. Huh? Hey, what's up? You go to the Apple Tip? I did. Hey, fine, nigga. 15 years, right? Hey. All right. There you go. Let's go. Apple Pie Tip, man. You said no? Yeah, I said yeah. Oh, oh we're taking a picture with you, though. All right. Here you go, man. Saying, she said, hey, she forgot my name. Yeah, I do. Oh, you heard me. I hear everything. It's Roland Martin. Roland Martin. I know. Yes. I, know, I, know, I, know, I, know I hear right. everything. I see that. Likewise. Can you come to the alumni tent for me, please? What? The alumni tent. The alumni All right, come on. Come on. All right, come on. Come on. Uh -huh. Come on. What's up, bro? Where's Lori? Extra person. All right, what's y'all? Uh -huh. hey, how are you? What's happening? What's happening? Happy homecoming, Clark Atlanta University. What up? What up? What up? What up? Get up, get up your phone. What's going on? What's happening? What's happening? What's happening?
what's up? What's up? On YouTube, all flesh to do it, check them out. I look at them every day, even when I'm driving the tractor trailer. Cause we ain't got enough uh, drivers, that's what they say. You back with that dog? You back with that dog? That's a dog on shame. That's a dog on shame. He's never missed a game out of the game. Go home! Get the hell out of the tent. I'm trying to get through. If you're not on the football team, you need to exit the tent right now. Hey, 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 hey,
Yeah, they dropped him. Make the show. I know you got Eddie. I know you got Eddie. No, I don't. I know you got Eddie. No, I don't. But you need to show the best thing. I'm going to show all of it. I'm a bum, 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 I'
Shut us down, see you, shut us down. So, but listen, after party, hot dog factory, tomorrow, whiskey mistress, run see you.com. Check out Monday. Yeah, just yeah, talk to the police. Um, whoever has that drone, come see me. I need that footage. Uh, All right. Come here, Ron. We gotta get you in. On, get we love you, Ron. Ah, we love you. Oh, there you go. You can... Our family. Oh, love, 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 love. 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 What's up? What's up? What's going on, bro? You good? I'm good. Good, we good. Here to see you homecoming. Let's go. Let's go. All right. Bro, Lynn, you've been doing it for the culture. We appreciate you. What's happening? What's Thank happening? You. All good? Yeah, you. All right. Absolutely. All right. Holla. In the morning. Yeah. Hey, baby. What's up, what's up? Yeah, they 
here. Respectfully, so I was homecoming. I'm dead serious from the Bronx, New York. You heard? Coretta J, you heard? <laughs> Excuse me. Hey, how you doing? What's happening? What's up, what's up? I was driving around like Excuse me. Hey, what's, what's up? up what's up? What's up? What it do, man? What's happening? What's happening? Brother Martin? Yep. I'm a grub. Hello, What's Monica. happening? Make a I'm good. Foundation. We started the foundation. Y'all starting the foundation? We did. Oh, started. We are featuring the essence this morning. Huh? We are featuring the essence this morning. First of all, you got to say the name of baby. My name is Marquita Tyson. I graduated from Parkland University, class of 2005. We started at making a way foundation so that we can get money to the university. We need a thousand subscribers at twenty-five dollars a month, which is three hundred dollars annually. If we get the uh, one thousand subscribers, that's three hundred thousand dollars a year. That is earmarked specifically to GAP scholarships. You want to tell me where to go? Making a way foundation. You have to scan a QR code that's on your button. You know the website? Absolutely, makingawayfoundation.com. Hold up, you gotta say that. Say it again. Makingawayfoundation.com. All right. Thank you. I'm good. I'm good. Hey, what's happening? What's going on? Pass away. Go away. Hey, hey. What's up? Take a picture of the front. Hello, Mr. Martin. How are you doing? What's happening? We're doing well. Good. Enjoying homecoming? Absolutely. Yes, happy happy homecoming. It's nice to see you here. Happy homecoming. Y'all just gonna jump in front of them while they talking about it. CAU 21 checking in. CAU 22. CAU 24. We love that you're here. Okay. Yeah, shout out Roland Martin. Shout Tell out me. Roland Martin, okay? Yeah, a person of the people. You don't know who Roland Martin is, girl. Don't say that. Y'all, that's what she I'm just saying, told me. Roland Martin. Martin. You just told me. Girl, let the her let, let her know. The man himself. Let her know. He showed on our promenade. Let her know. I like you know at least. I <laughs> do. I remember him. Broadcast like my show from here. From <laughs> here. Don't do Decide me. Decide to come by your homecoming today. Cut the, cut the camera. No. She said cut the camera. I own the camera. I, well, own my, I own my show. I own my network. A good time. Do this here. Pull your little phone out. Pull your phone out. You need to type. You need to type in your little notes section. Google Roland Martin. You need to go to my YouTube channel. Are you Roland Martin? And I Yes. Shut up. Shut up. How's she gonna say? You didn't hear them talking about. Don't embarrass me. Come on now, pretend like you know, at least. I know. I know. If I don't know, I know now. And this, she knows. And this gonna make the show. <laughs> she gonna be on the show. She gonna be on the show now. She gonna be on the show now. Oh, she on the show. Now she know. Now she know. And, and everybody call me this. Everybody call me this. You got that? I got you. Turn around. Turn around. So you know, everybody call me this. Yeah. Yeah. Lord have mercy. I'm sorry. Lord I'm have sorry. mercy. I'm sorry. She hilarious. It's, it's no disrespect. It, no, it's all good. I know who you it are now. Great. Well, you gonna make the show. I heard about you, so I know you know. <laughs> what you got? What you doing? I just, you know, I'm having a great time. It's homecoming. No, We're seniors. We're gonna graduate. We're gonna graduate. It's okay. See, 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 see. Hey, hey, hey. You, you, you. Let her know, dog. Let her know. Roll mine. Big friend. <laughs> oh, 06, 06 to the good brothers. Listen, I know oh, now. I know now. It's all good, but you, you gonna be on the show. No. So tell everybody your name. You made it. You made it. Um, own it. Own it. Tell everybody your name. My name is Serena. Serena, where you from? Um, Douglasville. Huh? Douglasville. All right, Serena, you gonna be on the Rolling Mark Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. What's happening? What's happening? Want to take a picture with you? What's going on? You, you, is it okay if I take a picture? No. no. Yeah, come on. Happy homecoming. Yes, happy homecoming. C.A. What up? What up? Hey. Oh, my God. What was that lady? What was her name that... What was her name, the lady that worked there? I can't yes, welcome to Clark Atlanta. The illustrious, the Auburn Tricky Lady, class of 08. Class of 08, say what's up. We're on the morning show. Yeah. Yeah. She was like, well, I mean, I'm not a 
Hey, I'm a Phillies fan. Take that jersey off. Go Strohs! Hey, hey, Mr. Martin, take that off. Go Strohs! Phillies. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the world champion jersey. Go Strohs! Oh, no, not, not, not the runner-up jersey. Go Strohs! Ace down! Y'all better focus on Arizona. I know. They give, they give <laughs> them a call. <laughs> What's happening? How are you? How was homecoming? Homecoming was... What is your Renaissance shoes? Fabulous. <laughs> How was it? Fabulous. Hold on, let me get in here. The Renaissance shoes. <laughs> <laughs> is this a video? How was homecoming? Yes, it's a video. Okay, you, you might want to say something. How was homecoming? I mean, you just walking up. Praise the Lord. How was homecoming? Really? That was how homecoming was? Praise the Lord. Can y'all y'all was beyond. I don't know what to say. I don't know. Homecoming was she don't know what to say. Okay. Homecoming was beyond. I enjoyed myself. Did you enjoy yourself? I didn't go here, but everyone was so warm. And they listened to my lives. Like, they jamming King my George over there. You finally had something to say, because you were like over there just struggling. All right, y'all, so this woman here talking about I need to have her on the oh, show, Lord. and she ain't even said nothing. She ain't said why. She ain't gave it no no background, no nothing. Since she can't, now, what were you telling me? What were you? I said that she's a former prosecutor for the biggest. And you notice she office. didn't bother to give her name. She just like, well, all she said was, I want a photo. Yes. And then she says, I need to have me on have, have you some lawyer. That ain't said no name or nothing. It's attorney Real Deal Neil. That's my name. Oh, that's your name. It's John Quell. Your mom, your mama named you Real Deal. Okay. Huh? Mama named name, name you Real Deal. What's your name? No, it is. It's John Quell Neil. Okay, gotcha. All mm -hmm. right. Okay. Back to what? What she do? She's a former <laughs> prosecutor for the Fulton County District Attorney's Office. It's the same office that we've been seeing a lot in the headlines. Yes, I'm, about a, I'm the aware. Trump I'm, okay. I'm aware. All right. I, I, I know what the Fulton County okay. DA's office we is. Gotta, we oh got, my God. I don't know where my audience really? is. I don't know where my That's, audience is. Girl, right you here. talking to me. Okay, okay, I'm talking to, okay. Brother I don't have. Hi, I'm Shari Trahan. I used to work there as well. She's so a lawyer as well. I am a lawyer. So what are you well. now, her publicist? <laughs> you see? No, I have my own firm, a personal injury firm. Oh, you personal injury. Now, what you do? Personal injury and criminal defense. Oh, okay, see, so you might want to leave with that. As opposed to, you know. You didn't give me a chance. You ain't stop with your name. It's homecoming. Why are you so intense at tailgate? Hold up. I'm not the <laughs> one who stopped me and said, oh, me you need to have me on your show one day. <laughs> I'm, an, <laughs> I'm an attorney, and I'm attorney. I'm the real deal. That's all she said. Well, she didn't say, I'm a, I'm a, you know, I handle tax law. Uh, uh, she ain't she say yeah. nothing. You broke it all down. I did, you know. She ain't say nothing. You didn't give me the opportunity. But you know what, Mr. Mark? What? You have a phenomenal show. I been, grew up watching you. You know? No, and you ain't gonna get on. That's okay. I'm <laughs> Don't do my girl like that now. What? Okay, what's your name again? Because it ain't the real deal. It's John Quell Neal. John Attorney Quell Neal. John Quell yeah, okay, Neal. all right. Okay. You done? Yes. I'm sorry, you done. And I'm, I'm your sorrow, so. I'm sorry, are you done? Because, yes. you know, she ain't give no details. I'm, I'm done. Shari Trahan signing out. So you're done? I'm done. So the video's over? Yeah. Tell her thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I'm, I'm, so you just walk around with plates. You just walk around with plates. Yeah, you homecoming to the fight. I got these cats tough and tails in fourth quarter sales. I'm used to seeing teams drop over the Take care. Yeah, what's up, bro? Y'all good? Huh? I'll drop my homecoming.
South Carolina State University. What up, SC State? I did y'all commencement. Yeah, it is. What up? Yeah, yeah, baby. Hold up. You are, there we go. All right, tell your president what's up. Yeah, it is. I ain't gonna get hit. You got it. You got everybody in order. All right, don't taste. Don't, don't taste nobody. Oh no, I ain't got time for All right, folks, so that is it uh, from 2023 Clark Atlanta University Homecoming. It's been a blast. Um, let me thank uh, the administration. Let me thank Sam uh, for hooking me up. And so uh, glad I was able to make it out. How y'all doing? My, all right, y'all. So it, it, she interrupted my video. So, so it's glad to be here uh, at homecoming. And so, you never know what university is going to drive by when I feel like it. All right, y'all. How? Black Star Network is here. Oh, no punch! It's a real um, revolutionary right now. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America. All the momentum we have now. We have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?